yeah please shout out if you can't hear me at any point because um i don't have headphones or anything so um if the audio becomes a problem just um yeah either type in the chat or, or unmute and shout out and we'll make I'll, I'll just shout or speak louder um yeah so some of this talk might uh be quite basic to some of you but i'm hoping that um by kind of bringing these ideas of this uh, winning the strikes and smashing the state together will generate some good discussion that should be useful for some of the, the big strategic questions that I think are facing the left uh, as a whole right now, especially in Britain, but in, in most countries, I think, in the global cost of living crisis. Um, so we've got more strikes going on in Britain than have been for years. But the interunion and interworkplace networks of solidarity that are the glue of class struggle are weak and sometimes almost non existent. The Tories are meeting even this small wave of industrial action with new anti strike legislation that is barely being resisted so far. And they're meeting the small wave of direct action from groups like Just Stop Oil and Palestine Action by trying to bring in more authoritarian police powers. In this context, it maybe sounds a bit grand to base a meeting on how to win strikes and smash the state, um, especially speaking as someone who has never won a strike or smashed the state personally yet. Uh, but as a revolutionary socialist, I think these two ideas get to the core of what we need to be thinking about right now. All of us need these strikes to win, not just because of the hundreds of thousands of workers fighting for better pay and the cost of living crisis, but also because these strikes will set the tone for the struggles that come after. And we need to think about how to smash the state for many reasons, not least because for the first time in a long time, huge groups of workers up and down the country are fighting not just their individual bosses, but the Tory government and even sections of the structures of the state itself. According to Mick Lynch, as an example of this, uh, the reason the RMT strikes are back on is because the transport secretary uh, vetoed the chair of the rail delivery group making an offer to the union last Monday. Um, and he has accused the government of lying uh, when they said that they didn't do this, basically. So uh, it, it, we're back to this, this question of um, the government, the, the, the kind of passing the buck between the government and the uh, the rail bosses and the rail workers being left uh, with no one willing to negotiate with them, um, which is an interesting kind of dynamic when it comes to the role, the, the the relationship between the government and the state, which I won't have time to go into, but I would love it if anyone else would like to. Um, so uh, yeah, socialists and revolutionaries in Britain need to become crystal clear on what the state is, what role it plays in class struggle and maintaining capitalism, and how we can hope to dismantle, crush or smash it. It feels like everyone in the left is looking around right now, trying to figure out what the hell we do collectively, as the gaping hole left by Corbynism has been filled, or gaped wider, by anti-strike, anti-protest Starmer. All the revolutionary left groups are small, and most lack the power, sharpness, or both, to do more than call big rallies or demos and coalitions. Though some, like RS21, are growing both in numbers and the level of our organisation. But the clock is ticking, and not just because of the repressive bills the Tories are putting through right now, uh, or the breakdown of the climate. If I have it right, when recession starts to bite, the workplace battles that are currently being fought over pay will become a lot harder for workers in an economy where there's less jobs to be found if you get sacked for organizing at work. The reason I think it makes sense to talk about smashing the state in this context isn't because I predict there will be organizing an insurrectionary general strike or entering a situation of dual power in the next few months, but because I think revolutionary ideas about the role of the state and what it means to be in confrontation, not only with governments, but with structures of the state itself, are crucial to finding good strategy and tactics in the next few months and beyond. So first, I'll talk a bit about what I see as the needs of the workers' movement and the struggles around climate and cost of living at the current moment, focusing mainly on the strikes, as promised. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit more about confrontation with the state. So how to win strikes. Um, I want to start with where we are, not where I, we wish we were, uh, which is that the union movement is much smaller than it was. Um, however, we're now seeing way more action than we have in years. Um, and this, this kind of mini strike wave, which is increasingly getting to the point where I no longer need to awkwardly say mini and I can just start saying strike wave, um, has really changed uh, the dynamic um, in, in class struggle a lot over, the, over 2022. Um, 
RS21 member Ian Allenson, uh, in an article he wrote recently for the website, uh, which I'll quote a few times in this talk, um, he, he describes the recovery of strike action as being driven by four things. I think it's useful to kind of dive into the reasons why this has happened. So I'll just list those four quickly. The first one is inflation. Um, which basically just, you know, with the, the prices of things going up, increases the cost of workers not taking action because pay is not indexed to inflation. So, uh, yeah, I, I, it, it becomes more and more that you're losing out by not taking the risks involved in strike action. At the same time, the risks of strike action feel less, or in fact, they are kind of less right now because we're in a tight labor market, which is the second reason. So unemployment is low. Um, the number of vacancies and jobs is historically high. Um, and according to Ian, a tight labor market reduces workers' fear of dismissal, reducing the risk of taking action. The third reason is that some of these strikes, especially things like the rail workers, have been disruptive enough to get to, to um, punch through uh, what Ian calls media indifference. Uh, and they've, they've basically achieved uh, massive visibility and a, a high level of public support as well, uh, kind of to the surprise of many of the, the, the members, I think. Uh, of those unions um, who've, who've said on picket lines and things that they've never experienced the level of public support they have now. And this does inspire other workers, including people who aren't already in unions, to turn to unionization and strikes to defend their, their livelihoods. Uh, and then the fourth reason um, is that workers have been on the back foot for ages. Um, and, you know, unionization has declined, strikes have been rare, we've had 10 years of austerity in Britain, um, terms and conditions have just been getting worse and worse and worse. Um, the way that Ian puts it is that years of accumulated grievances provide combustible material, which is fueling action over any issue. So we've got this surge in action, but at the same time, there's a weak rank and file um, that, that you, which by which I mean kind of the, the lay members of a union who aren't kind of the uh, the paid officials or the, you know, the elected head honchos, um, which used to be, you know, there used to be really strong horizontal organizing, but now that is quite weak. Um, and so the democracy, the democratic structures, um, the, the voice of the ordinary workers in their own disputes is weak, is kind of what I'm saying there. Um, and we've got this reliance on the trade union leaderships to make good decisions, which historically is not a good position to be in, uh, that you're just hoping that the, the people at the top are going to always do the right thing. Um, so things like numbers of strike days, when and how to escalate disputes, decisions to suspend strike action when monarchs die and stuff like that are all being taken from the top down, often with little or no consultation of the workers involved in the disputes. There also seems to be a bit of a lack of confidence among some groups of workers, and I can think of a few different reasons for this. One is that a large portion of the workers out on strike now will have never been on strike before in their lives. Um, another one is that traditions of solidarity right now are weak. You know, we used to have all of these different ways in which communities could rally around strikes, whether that's bucket shaking, workplace collections, delegations of strikers from one workplace to another and things like that. And that just hasn't been happening because there hasn't been as much striking. You know, there's that saying that striking is a muscle uh, and kind of the, the less it gets used, the, the weaker it becomes. And I think that solidarity around strikes kind of has a similar, similar trend to it. Um, another reason for this la lack of confidence is that union funds um, are not great. And, you know, that, I don't know if that's necessarily something that's particularly different from past decades, but basically, you know, availability of strike pay and hardship pay during strikes um, is, isn't great in a lot of unions. Um, and so I think that that maybe does affect it, especially in situations where workers haven't necessarily taken strike action before. They don't know how long this thing that they're getting into is going to be, how much of their pay is it actually going to affect. Are they going to end up losing more pay from going on strike than they get in the, the eventual settlement? Things like that. Um, and then the last one, a lack of confidence is because of this lack of what I call this rank and file organization uh, and, and lack of democracy, actually, in some unions uh, or functioning democracy, meaning that less workers have less say in how the disputes are run, which leads to less confidence um, or over-reliance on charismatic leaders to keep up morale. As I've said, this is a risky option. So going back to the title, How Do We Win Strikes, the first bit of the title anyway. Um, 
in uh, Workers Can Win, uh, a guide to organizing at work available from all good bookshops uh, and Pluto Press and uh, the its own website, workerscanwin.info, uh, by Ian Allenson. Uh, Ian says, you win a dispute when you can credibly threaten a big enough disruption cost to force the decision makers to change their approach and to make your preferred outcome the most attractive option for them. And that's my 10 minute timer. So I've only got five minutes left, which is going to be a struggle. Um, what do we mean by winning, though? Some big unions have routinely called below inflation pay rise settlements uh, wins recently. Um, and I think that's often boosterism. It's an overly optimistic way of presenting things. But sometimes it can genuinely reflect an improvement within the power relations within a workplace that is deeper than just like the percentage pay rise that the workers have won. Right. Um, so, again, I'm going to quote from Workers Can Win. No settlement is permanent. Employers and workers will be back to change the terms of a deal as work or the balance of power evolves. The most lasting impact of any dispute is the change in the confidence, organization, understanding and combativity of the workers involved. With all of that in mind, strikes win by escalating and holding out, uh, sometimes holding out and holding out and holding out until they get a decent offer, uh, until they win a settlement. So to answer how to win the strikes, we need to figure out what do the striking workers need in order to do that escalation and to do that holding out, which sometimes ends up looking a bit like trench warfare. Um, I think two things, basically. Good organization by the workers themselves and within the unions, uh, for which I recommend this book again, Workers Can Win. Um, and I'm not going to be able to go into much detail on what that looks like. And I think there's probably comrades on the call who can do that way better than me. Um, but in the interest of time, the second thing that I think these workers can need, that these workers need is good solidarity across the movement. Um, and I'll talk a bit more at the end about kind of what I think that could look like. So moving on to uh, how to smash the state. Um, I'm going to start very quickly with some theoretical ideas about the state and then wind my way back from there to the present moment and what we're facing. Um, so Engels uh, says the state is a product of society at a certain stage of development. The admission that this society has become entangled in an insoluble contradiction with itself, that it is cleft into irreconcilable antagonisms, which it is powerless to dispel. It exists for the purpose of moderating the conflict, of keeping it within the bounds of order, and this power is the state. Um, so this gets drawn on by quite a lot of communists and socialists through 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 the years as a kind of view of the state, which is that, you know, it, it is exists to kind of contain the class conflict, which if the state is not there to contain it, the class conflict will will just uh, be it's it's not it's not going to be able to maintain any kind of unstable equilibrium. It will become um, a state of all out war or a state of all out conflict or um, resolve itself into the, the complete uh breakdown of society is, is 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 kind of one way of reading what he said um i think this gets to the heart of a role of the state in the situation we're in today where ruling class interests benefit from and actively make use of this arrangement we have where the state power prisons police the courts and many other things can contain suppress and smash resistance uh, and struggle, whether that's a few climate protesters glued to a motorway or a national strike of tens of thousands of workers. Um, I'm going to read a couple more quotes about what needs to happen to the state if you agree with that concept of what the state is and what role it plays. So uh, Lenin uh, in State and Revolution says that the liberation of the oppressed class is impossible, not only without a violent revolution, but also without the destruction of the apparatus of state power, which was created by the ruling class. Um, and to complement that, I want to quote from the late Colin Barker, um, who says, Rosa Luxemburg was correct. Those who want to preserve the existing state machinery in the struggle for socialism are not simply arguing for a different road to socialism. They are arguing against socialism itself. The heart of the socialist idea is self-government in every sphere of life, including production. And the state, in its very essence, is nothing but a series of massive impediments to that self-rule. So during the last decade, capture of the state power, uh, you know, that what, what Colin Barker says is, is, is not arguing for socialism, um, through parliamentary election became a mass project for a massive chunk of the left, um, including me for a while. Uh, this was like uh, during a very early stage in my political development, uh, that some, some bits of the Corbyn moment. Um, 
And the huge questions were left unanswered during that period as to exactly how socialist being in and against the state would work. Um, in a way, things are a bit simpler now. <laughs> We've got Starmer as leader of the opposition. Um, I, you know, he's opposing the strikes. He's promising to go hard against climate protesters. But that doesn't mean that everyone suddenly agrees uh, that the state needs to be smashed. It hasn't necessarily fully clarified the situation at all, um, even if it, you know, people are increasingly uh, kind of disillusioned with the idea of, you know, electing electing socialism into existence. Um, so why is it useful for revolutionaries and socialists and revolutionary socialists to talk about state smashing and confrontation with the state power right now? Because the confrontation is happening right now, even if it's nowhere near the level where any full scale sm state smashing is on the cards just yet. Um, oh, I've just seen a comrade enter the waiting room. Sorry. That's all right. Um, so one way in which it's happening right now, which I want to zero in on, which I think is really important to discuss, is the anti-strike legislation that the Tories are bringing in. They said in their 2019 manifesto that we will require that a minimum service operates during transport strikes. Rail workers deserve a fair deal, but it is not fair to let the trade unions undermine the livelihoods of others. I think it's very interesting to note the similarity between that rhetoric and the kind of rhetoric that often gets used by right wing voices against climate protesters. Uh, it's this constant kind of idea of dividing people between the, the inconvenienced and those engaged in struggle. Um, but now they're introducing this law, which is actually going to force rail workers to basically scab on their own strikes uh, if it passes uh, and basically make effective striking unlawful. Um, and I'm not going to be able to go into loads of detail on it because I don't want to talk for way more than my allotted time. Um, maybe in the discussion, if anyone has particular questions about what that strike anti-strike legislation looks like, we can talk about it there or anyone else can weigh on it in on it if they want to. But essentially, uh, it's just going to put so much more pressure on unions to basically be crap and not do, not take the level of strike action or use any of the tactics um, that are currently allowed because of this thing of if you do an unlawful strike, your union's assets can be seized or you can be sued. There's loads of different modes of recourse. Again, coming back to this idea, the state's role is to suppress and dismantle the means of resistance and, and contain the class struggle by doing that, using the courts, the laws, all of those things. Um, so this is why I'm saying that, the, you know, a very tiny rise in, in, in strike action, industrial action after decades of suppression has led to the Tories very promptly responding with uh, a massive expansion of state power in the face of strikes, as well as all these policing bills, the national security bill, the anti-protest bill. And we need to be linking these things together. Um, as a good comrade, Willie Black, who hopefully will be here later in the meeting, um, said in a meeting back in July, whatever you're doing, speed it up. Um, we know some of the ingredients of solidarity that are missing from the current picture and would strengthen the movement. Workplace collections for strike funds, delegations of strikers to other workplaces, community solidarity groups, bucket shakes, rank and file networks and interunion structures in workplaces where different sections of the workforce are represented by different unions, sectoral combines, joint strike action, joint rallies and demonstrations, delegations from climate and social movement groups to pickets, the list goes on. Um, even getting some of these going on a bigger scale uh, would lay the groundwork for workers' confidence to escalate to longer or indefinite strike action in the national disputes that have been rumbling on for months now. Um, there's some bigger questions, too, about the situation up here in Scotland, which I hope other comrades will weigh in on after the uh, Supreme Court ruling today, the role of the SNP as a kind of uh, mediator of the teacher strikes up here, and also in, the, in this question about uh, the relationship between government and state power. Um, but I'm going to skip right to the very end, because I think I've probably gone over 15 minutes. Uh, and instead of a pithy conclusion that implies I've sewn this whole thing up in the last 15 minutes, um, I'd rather end on a list of questions, hoping that they might be helpful in shaping the discussion we have for the rest of this meeting. How can we act as revolutionaries to build power across all the key movements of the class struggle and make sure they don't get dammed up by whatever state repression or reformist diversion gets put in our way? How can we build solidarity and unity across the left that doesn't just tolerate socialist and revolutionary voices, but increasingly recognizes the need for these ideas? How can we bring down the government? And how can we bring down the one after that too? 
Uh, thank you to the Edinburgh Comrades for inviting me to speak, and I'm looking forward to hearing what all of you have to say about this. I hope so. I hope that's a yes. The um, yeah, I just wanted to. Do, this is basically like what I described as scenes of solidarity, and uh, I quite like to start off with this one because what you've got is a it's almost a classic view of the picket line. Um, you've got sort of lots of guys. Some of them, are, some of them are friends of mine, by the way. So this is not like a criticism, uh, but basically guys with clenched fists and some flags, and they all look very angry. And supporters are allowed, but they're actually in boxes. So I thought the first thing to do would be I'd like to actually at least let the the UCU out of the box because they're going on strike. I think is it tomorrow? Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, because there's more to this picket line than see see than than than, than the PS. Because this is the um, our a series of RMT picket lines in Edinburgh um, during the summer and kind of getting into the autumn, and the kind of community support and also other trade union support that this was actually um, gaining. Because as Charlotte says, basically, this is just exactly the kind of solidarity you need. So other folk who were about basically, uh, the this is um, this is the UCU. Including, uh, I think our own our own grandmothers in, mm -hmm. the, in in the corner, um, they were there. That was a bit of trade union support. We also had, um, well, basically you've got the you've got folk from uh, EIS, you've got folk from Unison, folk from Unite. I think the, there's a Communist Party banner in the background. I think Edinburgh Trade Union Council mm -hmm. were there, and also Leslie was there with a, a big pride flag. Because effectively, one of the things we're wanting to demonstrate is that you can be, well, the thing about being about now is you can be an active trade unionist and also you can be an LGBT campaigner. And there are some very good LGBT organisations and a lot of trade unions now. So on from that, more community support and more trade union support. You can see the CWU flag there and also the folk from Living Rent. And living rent, by the way, are a very good example of how to how a community organisation can work with trade unions because they've done a lot of work uh, promoting what's happening in strike areas and also actually working in detail with folk in the CWU going round door to door together, basically promoting the idea of affordable housing and rent in um, in, in in Scotland and across the country. But actually, with CWU folk mm. as well. So basically, community and workplace working together. Emra anti raids. Basically, I'm involved with that, as is Leslie. Um, folk who are basically wanting to stop, or rather, sort of, yeah, basically wanting to stop immigration raids from happening in Edinburgh. And it's, and I think it operates nationally mm. as well. Mm. So that's very good. Um, they were there in support. Folk from Just Stop Oil were there. And also, basically, we've had LGBT activists as well. Um, this is one of my favourite photographs, but it was outdone, I think, by this, which was when there was a, a breakaway from the Pride protest in Edinburgh. Uh, when folk discovered that the Pride protest was at least being partly funded by, uh, I'm trying to remember what Exxon. by Exxon, mm -hmm. um, a large number of folk actually went off and uh, and joined the joined the picket line. So that was fun. That was a fantastic day. Fortunately, we didn't hear about it. It just it, it just it just kind of happened. So <laughs> it does happen. Right. Folk from uh, in this case, you've got uh, youth in resistance. Um, they were there too, so they've been they've, they've, they've been doing some excellent work on on solidarity. And there was even a picket line cat. Because uh, I'm not quite sure who who that lady was involved with, but the cat was very good. So, in some ways, really, you can actually redefine that first picket line photograph by something like this: the RMT. Yes, it's basically it's their picket line, but <laughs> effectively, there's lots of different organisations. And that's me doing a bad Freddie Mercury impersonation in the middle. So, anyway, that's the, the picket lanes. Taking things on the site in the other direction, we're also seeing some very good 
trade union support for Pride. Folk like the PCS, in fact, well, these ladies were actually on the RMT picket line and they went out, then went down to Pride. We've seen Asleth flags on the Edinburgh Pride. Mm -hmm. We've seen RMT there as well. And also the absolutely wonderful, this is the um, this is Unison Lothian Health Branch. Watch out for more of them later on. They're fantastic folk. Now, this is a slightly different situation. Um, this this is this, these are folk from um, Edinburgh University, <clears throat> who were uh, outside the Scottish Parliament, um, very much pro-choice <clears throat> there on the question of basically like, sort of abortion rights and 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 health. But I think in that case, there was basically there was only two of us were there that actually had trade union flags. And I think mm -hmm. one person actually asked really, as a student, they'd never really come across trade unions and didn't really know very much what they were about. But I think Leslie was able to, to inform them about that. So for some people, um, maybe for some trade unionists, working with community activists is really quite a new thing and can actually be a bit outside of the comfort zone. And for some folk, the idea of actual trade union involvement can be something that's new as well. Oh, go back up. And here they are again. This is the uh, Unison Lothian Health Branch again. And this is actually at uh, an initial thing on what we call trade unions in communities, which is an excellent initiative that um, Willie Black and quite a number of folk have been involved in actually establishing a community home in Craig Muller in this instance, enlisting the support of trade unions, both financially and in terms of volunteers, to actually establish a place where people can go, not only to get advice on benefits, but also to get advice on trade union organisation. Because, well, with the level of trade union organisation we've got now, we need to be doing an awful lot of recruiting. And this is one of the ways to do that. And the great thing is, it is it's not, it's non-partisan, basically, if somebody goes along, then they are advised to join an appropriate trade union. So a unison member might be a volunteer, but they might actually say, well, in this case, the thing to do is join some join join GMB or join Unite. Yeah. And there's a bit more trade unions in communities with the, the banner actually at Craig Muller. And here they are again. In this case, this is actually at the um the <clears throat> COP27 climate protest in Edinburgh. There was a good trade union contingent there, and particularly, you see, you've got all the folk from trade union in communities there. Um, this was it, um, what did we find? Yeah, CWU, RMT, Unison, and Ignite were all there, basically, they all, and they were all marching under that, under that one banner. And we've also basically, there's been trade unions basically getting involved with um, Fridays for Future, which has been very good because there's folks there from uh, from Unison, folks there from Unite, and uh, there's Leslie with a big proud flag again and uh, a Unite flag. And the union support, trade union support, I think has been very well received. Right. Now, this is maybe a slightly more kind of difficult area because the what we found was the, the gender recognition reform in Scotland is that maybe for some organizations it's maybe just a bit outside of the kind of the, the comfort zone. Um so what you find is that there are some good trade unionists there and lots of good activists. Um person there with the, I think it was it's the United LGBT flag and, uh, and lo a lot of kind of general support but the level of trade union support there the level of engagement seems to be less than we might desire although I do understand that the STUC did make it clear to the Scottish government that they supported the gender recognition reform bill but that was mainly that was kind of like in the background In this case, basically, at the uh, Armani protest in Edinburgh, where LGBT activists were 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 very were very welcome, 
and uh, that was the, it was very it was a very very moving scene and similarly more folk so really what we're trying to do is continue i suppose to, to build that connection that we want to basically have trade unionists and folk in communities working together and to widen the arguments so basically you can be you're a gmb member who supports the strikes and wants trans liberation now and i think that's me